So my name's Meg Linton. I'm the CEO of the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation. And um, I'm still going to say I'm the new CEO because I haven't quite been here a year yet. And I'm still learning the ropes. Um, and before we get started, I've got um, a couple things. One, could you all turn off your cell phones? Um, we are recording this evening. Um, and we post all of our videos online, which is really exciting because they become a great educational resource for our community. And um, I would also like to take a moment to have everyone turn to your par neighbor, whoever you're sitting next to, and introduce yourself to somebody you don't know. Okay, now that we all know each other. <laughs> so. Part of, the reason I, part of the reason I like having everyone kind of meet and greet is because I feel like the library is not only a place for where we can um, do independent education and learn whatever we need to learn, and it's a resource that's always open to everyone to help us fill out. The librarians are great, answer our crazy questions, help us fill out forms. You can get your passport here. You can do all kinds of things at the library. But I also feel it's a place of fellowship where we all kind of come together and every walk of life is welcome. So thank you for being here. And I'm super excited about this program. Um, I do want to, as I said, I have a couple announcements. One is um, if you live locally in the community, you might know, that you might have heard that um, there is a proposal before city council right now to build a lecture hall, a proper lecture hall for the library where we will have raked seating, latest technology and everything, and hopefully have about 275 seats and be a beautiful facility for us to do uh, more events like this in there. And we have a big city council meeting on November 19th where we really need the public to show up and show their support. It's really important to have bodies in the room. So if anyone's interested in finding out more about that or wanting to come and show their support, please see me after the event. Um, we also have, um, as you know, this may, or you don't know, this is part of, a, this program's part of a series called Library Live. And we have another event coming up in November, and um, it's with Dibby and Herbie Fletcher. They're part of one of SoCal's first families of surf. And Rizzoli Book just published this beautiful book on the history of their family. They actually have five generations of family who started shaping boards in the 50s and then became very involved in the surf clothing industry. And every one of them have won major championships as surfers and so forth. And it's going to be, they're, they're a wild family and it's going to be a really fabulous talk. And the book is beautiful. They opened, they did a huge celebration at Gagosian Gallery in New York to launch the project. And we're really thrilled to be the first venue to kind of host them since it just came out a couple weeks ago. So we hope you'll come. It's on November 14th. And then I'd also like to ask, how many of you are members of the Library Foundation? <coughs> Wonderful, that's great. And then to all of you who are not, there's more information on the back and it's an opportunity for you to join and support the library and hear, hear about all of our great programs and so forth. Um, I'd like to um, also do a shout out to our sponsors for this evening. Um, they've been listed on the screen earlier and also just to um, our board member, Natasha Palmer and her husband, Todd, who have made a sizable donation to help make this event hap these events happen. And also to our library live committee. If, are there any of our committee members here this evening? Nancy's here, she's the chair of our committee. So well, thank you, Nancy. She's one of our board members as well. So we have a volunteer committee that select all of the programs for um, our series. So it's really nice to work with community members on this. Um, I also want to thank one of our foundation members, Carl Neiser, who's sitting up here in the front row. Yay, Carl. Um, he's the one responsible he, um, for bringing tonight's guests to Allison and Sharon to our attention. Um, through his work as a board member of the nonprofit agency Seneca Orange County, he's made us aware that there are over 50,000 children in the state of California who are waiting to find a safe home and loving family. Now, if you think about it, in Newport Beach, there's only 85,000 people residents. So that's the size of a small town if you have 50,000 people. So there's a huge need and I'm sure many of you are part of the process and already know that. Um, the work Sharon and Allison do 
um, is to help those who choose to adopt and those who are adopted to develop into a family and enter as a unit into their neighborhood, school, religious organization, and their local community. And a, just a little bit about our speakers for those who don't know them. Allison is a nationally recognized expert in the fields of child welfare and children's mental health specializing in attachment, trauma, and permanency and adoption. She's the executive director for the National Center on Adoption and Permanency and was the child welfare, welfare consultant on the Paramount Pictures movie Instant Family. She is co-author and master trainer of Kinship Centers Act, an adoption and permanency curriculum for child welfare and mental health professionals, and co-author and master trainer of Pathways to Permanence, Parenting the Child of Loss and Trauma. Allison received the Congressional Coalition Angels in Adoption Award in 2017. Sharon is an internationally known trainer and author who helped pave the way for open adoption practice, believing in keeping connections over time. She has been devoted to her work in adoption and foster care since 1963 and is also a parent by birth, adoption, and foster care. She co-authored the book, The Open Adoption Experience and Cooperative Adoption. She is co-author and master trainer of Kinship Centers Act and Adoption and Permanency Curriculum for Child Welfare and Mental Health Professionals. And Sharon is a consultant for the National Center on Adoption and Permanency. So we really have the experts in the room. And so please join me in welcoming Sharon and Allison. Hello, can you guys hear us? Oh, I forgot sure. to turn my mic on. Yes. Excuse my back. We always hear that and we go, who are those people? Right? You hear that introduction, I'm like, where is that person? <laughs> Sharon's going to go first, and we're going to tag team this, and then we're going to do 30 minutes of questions at the end. So as we're moving through this, please hold and think about the questions that you want to ask us. We are so delighted to be here um, amongst a lot of good friends, family, um, and people that I've gotten to know and Allison has gotten to know through our years of work who've become like family to us and folks who've come a long distance because they got to know me through their journey of adoption. And so I'm really thrilled that you're all here and we want to make it an easy, comfortable evening with lots of dialogue back and forth. I want to thank Nancy and her husband for their lovely hosting of that beautiful reception at your home. I passed the wine because I wasn't <laughs> sure I could keep track of my notes. <laughs> Bring some to me afterwards. <laughs> to Meg for the, where are you Meg? Oh, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, Kunga, who has just been, this is a well-oiled machine. I gotta tell you, we travel a lot. And this was a pleasure. This was a pleasure. You and your staff are remarkable. And um, so I'm going to kind of jump in and talk a little bit here about the book. So we're glad you're here. Thank you. And I want you to know that there's a lot of people in the audience who've known me for a very long time, and I'm not sure why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them actually um, did the editing on the book. <laughs> so it's like, you know the book inside and out. Um, can you give us the next slide? Thank you. That's the book. Okay. Now, what I want to say about the book is it's about 500 pages. And it's about 500 pages, and when you pick it up, it's heavy. And it really is the epitome of what adoption, foster care, relative caregiving, donor insemination, and surrogacy feels like. It's heavy. It's dense. There's a lot to it. There's nothing simple about it. The first half of the book is really the practice part of the book. The book is a what we would call a public-facing book. It's written for the folks who are touched by adoption, foster care, relative caregiving, surrogacy, and donor insemination. And believe it or not, there's 100,000 donor babies born every year. And they have many of the same issues as those of you who are here who are adopted into families or were fostered. So what we've done is expanded in this book to a much larger population, making it relevant to a broader section of our community. Those first 
few 250 pages that will spell out what we're talking about in terms of the core issues which we're going to get into in a short time. The second half of the book is the practical side of the book. It's people's looking through the lenses of their experiences, most of them constellation members, and I'll explain that word to you. And so we're looking at the core issues through the African American perspective, through the Latino perspective, through the Asian perspective, through siblings, through foster parents, all the way through that whole lens. It makes it real to you no matter where you fit in this constellation. What's a constellation? Anybody in this room who's been touched by adoption, foster care, relative caregiving, surrogacy, or donor insemination is part of it. Whether you're an extended family, whether you're a neighbor, whether you're an educator, if you are touched bumping up against other folks who've been experiencing these forms of family building, you are indeed a member of the constellation. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now the book um, ends every chapter with tools because we don't want you to think when we're done today that you're, we just totally depressed you. It's like, oh my God, what do we do with all this? There is at the end of every chapter several pages of tools to address the issues we're going to raise because we're not going to leave you hanging, okay? Thanks, Allison. When we talk about the seven core issues in permanency, we're really talking about the experience of adoption and permanency for Constellation members that create lifelong intergenerational issues. It's not just about the parents or the children. It's about the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. It's about the siblings and who they marry. It's about nieces and nephews. So it's a much bigger community than maybe we give credence to. And I have to tell you in my practice many, many times who's sitting in the waiting room over the years is the great-grandchild of somebody who was adopted or somebody who placed a child for adoption who's coming back and trying to close the circle, looking for missing relatives, trying to get information about themselves that had been lost through the generations. So this really is an intergenerational process. When we adopt or we foster, we're affecting our parents, our siblings, our nieces and nephews. So it goes both ways. It goes up the ladder and down the ladder. Okay? Hold on one second there. Okay. Um, next one would be good. Thank you. The experience of adoption, as I said, is lifelong and intergenerational, but the goal of the seven core issues has always been about depathologizing adoption, helping us see it as another way of building families that has added tasks involved. And if we can see what those tasks are and address them, we can have a successful experience. So we wanted to depathologize what some people have made all over the internet, all over Twitter, a really, really difficult time for some of the members of our community. For me, addressing the complexities gives us the joy and the growth that we need. It's what's made 56 years in the field worthwhile to me. So it becomes adoption about addition and not subtraction. It's about adding family to gain permanency rather than having to lose a family. And I will ask you when you got married, how many of you flipped a coin and decided which family you got to keep? <laughs> how many married couples here said, I like my family better? Oh, you did? You raised your hand? Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> What's important here is that we want to add people on, not send them away. Does that make sense to everybody? So one of these pieces then is about adding and not subtracting. And the other piece is for adoptees to not have to experience divided loyalties, to be able to love everybody, to acknowledge nature and nurture and combine them in who they are until they find out exactly who they are as individuals. And that's the purpose of the core issues. This is the old adoption image. This is what we lived with for many years. When I came into the field in 63, that's what we looked at. We had the child, we had the adoptive parents, and we had the birth parents, but I will tell you it was the birth mother. 
because for many, many years, birth fathers didn't count. And I've shared with a lot of you publicly before, if I had only known about, I'm not adopted, but if I'd only known about the history of my birth mother, I would have been sure that I'd been stolen, kidnapped, or upset in the nursery and put in a different crib. <laughs> because the truth is, I'm not at all like my mother's side of the family. They are short, petite, quiet, <laughs> unassertive <laughs> people. I am my father's side of the family totally. They're loud, big women, and that's me. <laughs> so, thank you, Wendy. So, it's very hard to grow up not knowing anything about your birth father's side of the family. So we have to look at the fact that for many, many years, only birth mothers came up on that triangle. And not older children, not children out of foster care, not children from other countries, just infant adoptions. That's what we were talking about. And largely adoptive parents who were infertile and used adoption as a way of completing their family system. That's the old way of looking at things. Language has changed. Now we talk about birth and first, birth first parents. And why do we add first? Because a lot of our children in the system who go from foster care to adoption had first parents. They weren't just born to somebody, they spent time with them. And those first parents left a strong mark, impression, memories, experiences with their child. So now we talk about the birth parent who gave birth, but we also talk about first parents, the first ones up. And some of our kids have had a succession of parents as they've floated through uh, the foster care system. We talk about real. Who are the real parents? Are those your real kids? That word has been really a part of our system for a very long time. And there are three kinds of real parents. There's the parenting parents, the everyday people, there's the genetic parents, and there's the legal parents. Most of us grew up with our legal parents, our parenting parents, and our genetic parents all wrapped into one couple. Kids adopted out of the foster care system or adopted at birth, they will have legal parents and parenting parents, but they will be separated from their genetic parents. So we have to really look at that as another shift. Our practice has moved into much more openness, much more accepting, movable boundaries, which we'll talk a little bit about. And I want you to think for just a minute if I use these words, don't say out loud, but think about them. If I use these words as stereotypes, what comes to mind for you when I say pregnant, unwed mother? When I say uncaring, absent birth father? When I say foster mother, foster father, foster child, special needs child, what issues come up for you? Because we really are having to change the language and the stereotypes to make adoption healthier. And that's part of what we address with the seven core issues. And if you want to think about the myths in adoption, go see Allison's movie, Instant Family. Because it is filled with every myth you could possibly imagine. Now we laugh at it. They're presented in a humorous way but they really bite the people for whom it is real. Okay. First of all, I love that Sharon just said Allison's movie, right? Because I'd be a gazillionaire right now. <laughs> and you are, and you are. <laughs> I was the consultant on the movie, but uh, yeah, I wish it was my movie. Um, uh, first of all, we're so excited that you're here. Um, Sharon and I are tag teaming, so fist bump to my partner in crime in every way. Sharon has been, those of you that know Sharon, my, one of my mentors for about 25 years. So how blessed has Allison been? So I really realize how blessed I am. So one of the things Sharon and I worked really hard to do, and the reason why we wanted to present kind of the old practice, right? This is, if you think about 1960s and 1970s and 1980s, we think, hey, we've come a long way in the field of adoption and foster care practice, right? Wouldn't you think that? Yeah, 
Not so much. <laughs> We have a long, long way to go. So we want you to have this visual and then shift it into what we really try to do in the book. So what I want you to see is the, the bottom of the triangle now, we have the seven core issues, which is the foundation um, for the constellation members. These are when we say lifelong intergenerational complexities and challenges for all members of the constellation. We put the constellation members in the middle because they all have more in common than they do not in common. One side of the triangle, we have to integrate this thing called attachment. And Allison only gets five minutes to talk about attachment, so that's a problem. Because <laughs> those of you that know me go, oh no, she needs three days to talk about this thing called attachment. <laughs> and then this other thing called trauma. So right now what I'm gonna do is walk you through trauma and attachment before we go into the core issues. So you're getting two sides of the triangle, then the foundation. Are you guys with me? And again, it's a light touch. We're just teasing you, because then you really have to buy the book, right? <laughs> so you see where we're going. So the first thing I want to kind of pull you into is this thing called trauma. And what I'd mostly have you think about is that all trauma is not created equal, right? All trauma is not created equal. We're using this word now like everything's a trauma. I had a traumatic day at work. No, let's not butcher this word. We're going to be really specific when we talk about trauma. And we're going to talk about this thing called adverse childhood experiences to make sure that we really understand the impact of what we call adverse childhood experiences and the toxic stress it creates for children and impacts every aspect of their development. What happens in childhood doesn't stay in childhood. It builds a brain, right? So we have to rethink what we, how we're thinking about trauma, especially this thing called developmental trauma. So ACEs, how many folks in the room are familiar with ACEs? Just a show of hands. Yes, whoop whoop for you guys, already getting ACEs. I'm gonna uh, just introduce you to a couple resources and help you kind of conceptualize what we mean and how we stumbled onto this. I say we like I had some input in any way, which I did not. <laughs> um, ACEs came out of a study that was conducted by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente. And what they were doing, and by the way, it wasn't a little study. It was a huge study with 17,000 patients that had Kaiser insurance. And these were individuals that were struggling with a diagnosis of morbid obesity that had all these extenuating health issues connected to that. And they couldn't figure out why nothing they were doing was really working effectively with this population. And as you could guess, what do you think they stumbled on? Trauma, trauma, and more trauma, and not just any kind of trauma, but developmental trauma, adverse childhood experiences. And it's helping to reframe how we think about this thing called trauma, specifically childhood trauma. Because normally, historically, when, when we think about trauma, don't we think about a child getting beaten or a child getting abused or molested? We have a pretty narrow understanding of trauma. What ACEs did was really expand that. When a child has their attachment caregiving system impacted, so let's say six moves in foster care, that's a trauma for the child. So we go, well, hey, that child's not being beaten or that child wasn't molested. When you a, a disrupt their attachment caregiving system, it's a relational trauma for the child. So thinking about ACEs, I want you to think about this last bullet here. Every ACE counts as one. There are five that are relational. So hitting my interpersonal system, thinking about neglect. Think about a child that's lived in an orphanage for three years, his first three years of life. That's minus three years of, of his attachment caregiving system, maximizing all areas of his development. So when we think about an ACE score of just one, I want you to visualize, any visual learners in here? Okay, you're gonna be, get welcomed into my world for a second. <laughs> I want you to think about a staircase. And a staircase year one is the first year of life. Year two is the second step. And year three, think about each year, every step has developmental milestones and tasks. One trauma, one ace, hits every step of the staircase for the child. So when we normally think about a traumatic episode, we're thinking about somebody that's 25 that might have had a, a, a domestic violence episode. When you, we think about childhood trauma, you think about every stage of their development is being hit by that one incident of trauma. 
think about an ACEs score of two or three. So an ACEs score of three might be the child was physically abused, has an alcoholic parent, and the mother's in a domestic violence relationship. So even an ACEs score of three is hitting the child's developmental stages at one, two, three, four, throughout their childhood. Significant? See, developmental trauma is very different. What we know happens to the child specifically is all of this toxic stress gets embedded and encoded within their neurobiological structures. So what happens in childhood does not stay in childhood. It gets wired and embedded within the neurobiological structures of the child. Now the important thing, that I, again, I only do the Debbie Downer thing for a moment and then it gets good. <laughs> because we cannot heal what we cannot acknowledge. So it's always really important. We can't go in and do any erasing into the neurobiological structures, but we can always go back and start adding corrective sensory oriented experiences. You guys with me? The reason why we show this picture of the child, I want you to think about his mind state and his brain. And that really on every staircase, when he's one and two and three and four, those first three years, 90% of his brain is being developed core structures. Really important those first three years because that little brain comes into the world extremely malleable, ready to learn, and it will adapt to any environment we put that little brain in, whether it's loving and warm and comforting and structured or chaotic and soothing and hostile and violent. That brain will adapt to that environment. So the lingering effect, so let me just give you the data because some of you might be going, oh my gosh, I think I have an ace. I might have an ACE. I, have, I might have an ACE score of two or three. <laughs> so I want you to look at this visual. 36% of us, so about a third of us, have zero ACEs. So those of you that are very blessed in this world to have no trauma, <laughs> we go, yes, do not raise your hand because you might not make it out of here. <laughs> On this bottom darker green, 26% have an ACEs score of one. The darker green, ACEs score of two and then three. See the yellow? ACEs score of four or more. And again, four or more on every stage of development. So I want to give you the, the data. And what the ACEs study backed us into, because what the ACEs study backed us into is what the real gateway drug is, is childhood trauma. It's why we might need to numb from the feeling that I'm feeling. So the rates, if you have an ACEs score of six or more, you minus your life expectancy by 20 years. An ACEs score of four or more, you're seven times more likely to become an alcoholic. You're 10 times more likely to inject or use drugs or be an addict. I want you just to think about being an, uh, an addict or becoming an alcoholic because I don't want to feel what my body feels all the time because it's so toxic and stressful. I'm working hard to numb. So what happens in childhood does not stay in childhood. Now look at this number. An ACEs score of seven or more increases suicide attempts by 3,100%. So what is the gateway drug? It's trauma, trauma, and more trauma. By the way, the neat thing, you wanna know how cool California is? I mean, you guys live here, so you get it, right? So our um, sur new Surgeon General of the state of California is Nadine Burke Harris. Watch her TED Talk. By the way, if you, get, if you get nothing else from here and you don't get our book, um, watch her TED Talk. Google Nadine Burke Harris. Her 15 minutes on ACEs is unbelievable. And she's the biggest advocate. What she'd like to have in the state of California is every pediatrician screens for ACEs. Because imagine how much trauma we could be avoiding um, if we actually did early intervention with our kids and our families. Right? So why is this thing called attachment important? Well, I want you guys to do me a favor because I like to talk about the difference between love and attachment. Because most of us go, well, love and attachment, it's all the same, right? I want you guys to hold up your hands with me, okay? Go like this, okay? So this right here, this is love. Love is nice, we like love, right? You guys like love? We like love, love is good. Now I want you to slowly go like this, 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 this. Hit the person next to you, boom. Boom. <laughs> Hit the person next to you. This, as far as you can get it, is this thing called attachment. 
It is so unbelievably critically important for the development of the child, and not only for the child, but it actually teaches us the dance of connection, how we get our interpersonal needs met through human connectedness. Either I'm going to be able to do this dance and get my primary attachment needs met, or I'm not going to learn this dance very well. There's different styles and patterns, and it's research evidence-based. It's actually phenomenal, but I don't have time to go deeply into attachment, so we're going to do a light touch. I wanted to connect this to developmental trauma, because five of those traumas that you saw in ACEs were connected to the lack of attachment. If my mother is an alcoholic or is clinically depressed, she is not emotionally available to attune to my needs, what I need from her. So on every stage of development, my attachment issues and challenges or, or needs really are, are not met. They might be minimized. So if my attachment caregiving system is disrupted or I lose my primary attachment caregivers, it's a traumatic experience for the child. And we have folks that can grow up and not know how to get their primary attachment needs met, right? So it impacts our ability to have intimacy. So early attachment experiences actually create my belief system about myself. Am, am I deserved of love? Am I worthy? Am I good? Do I deserve to have my needs met? If nobody shows up or people keep moving me from home to home to home, I might learn that my needs aren't very important and I'm not good enough to be held on to or I'm not very valuable. So I might feel like I'm not worth very much, right? Unworthy. So we're going to connect attachment here. Let's say I've spent the first three years, if I'm a child, in an orphanage or in foster care where I moved six times, changing mothers six times. That's a traumatic experience for a child. And it actually leaves them not here. This is actually optimal development, I think brain development and neurobiological development. We flip that over when the attachment caregiving system has been impacted. And it could be mom is there but she's clinically depressed or using substances. When a child is stuck in the inverted triangle, they stay in what we call hyperarousal, uh, internal toxic stress, where they are unable to find homeostasis. You know, in your bodies right now, I want you to think just for a minute, most of you are in what we call homeostasis, which is a very relaxed, calm, you have a resting heart rate, a resting respiratory rate. You, it, you can learn optimally because your body is very relaxed. So your brain can actually be, be fully attuned to learning in this moment. Many of our kids with toxic stress stay in hyper arousal. This triangle's flip, so they're in survival mode. So it's like they're treading water in a swimming pool, right? So they don't learn to regulate. You guys know what we mean by regulate? So if they're up here in distress, they might be really misdiagnosed as being hyperactive, or they, maybe they fit into an ADHD category, but it's really developmental trauma and the effects of developmental trauma that hit their sensory system, leaving them in hyperarousal. Because all of us, by the way, came into the world not knowing how to regulate from the inside out. We have to learn those skills, and we actually learn those skills through attachment. And what if we don't have healthy, secure parental attachment? The last piece I want to give you on attachment is the fancy term that we give all of you guys. How many folks are parents right now? Any kind of parent? So I know your term might be mom or mama or dad or daddy or papa, but what you've been doing with your child, there's a term for your role, and I want you to think about this triangle, that you are, if you're parenting, what we call the external psychobiological regulator of your child's internal affective states. That means it's your job to regulate them from the outside in, which for our parents that are getting kids of high trauma, you actually have to move towards their distress because who else is going to help them downregulate and, and learn how to stay in homeostasis? You have to actually move towards their pain and distress. Otherwise, they can stay in hyperarousal for hours, days, or years. Some of our kids live with tremendous levels of toxic stress. So how important is attachment? It is the healing element. Um, it's one of the reasons why family attachment therapy is so important for our children, because it's often not the children we're working with, because who's the healing element? You guys go, oh, that's us? Yes, that's you. All right, I'm tag teaming with my partner in crime. 
fun to have her as a partner, right? <laughs> Are you the Fultons? No. Sorry, you just look familiar to me. <laughs> okay, I like you anyway. <laughs> All right. We're going to move on to what is this thing called the seven core issues of adoption and permanency. If you look at this diagram, you see a really big circle labeled loss. Everybody loses something significant before they gain anything in adoption, foster care, or any of the other forms of permanency. This is an important starting point. It changes the trajectory of your life. If you were a child who was supposed to be a green, you're now a brown, mm -hmm. right? Maybe a different religion, different neighborhood, different school system, different culture, different race. Whoever you were is gone, and you now become a whole other person when you get adopted. I'm not saying it's bad or good. I'm just saying that's the loss, right? I was a mother. I was a father. And because of either choice or circumstances with the court, I am no longer a mother or father to that child on a day-to-day -day basis. I lose all control and choice. And I lose the image that I had in the community, in my church, in my family, in my neighborhood, in my job. I wasn't a parent to this child. This child was a stranger to me. And now, in a matter of a short time, I've become totally responsible for attaching to this child and doing all the work that Allison just talked about. It changes the trajectory of our lives. When our family adopted across racial lines, we changed the trajectory of our family's lines intergenerationally. Is that making sense to everybody? We lose control. We lose power. We may lose status. We have to acknowledge the losses. So what we do when we have a loss is we try to figure out what caused it so maybe it won't happen to us again. If I'm a kid, I need to figure out what caused that to happen to me. And we develop a feeling of rejection or a fear of rejection. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay, feeling or fear of rejection. Nope, back up, please. <laughs> I'm supposed to do. I have to figure out how to go back. Okay. <laughs> Remember, I'm describing the diagram. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Rejection leads to issues of shame and guilt, issues of self-esteem. This is where our self-esteem comes in. Shame and guilt are different. Shame is a very early emotion. It's pre-verbal. Guilt, we don't develop until we have a conscience. So somewhere between seven or eight or nine, if we develop a conscience, our parents can make us feel guilty. Most of us, how many have had doses of guilt, depending <laughs> upon whatever our culture was in our background, right? Guilt actually organizes our life. It gives us the road map unless it pounds us into the ground. Shame is, I don't feel good about who I am. I don't need to be here. I'm worthless. Shame is very deep and harder to reach. Those losses that create feelings or fear of rejection, issues of shame and guilt, have to be grieved and it's very hard to do that in our society, in a society that says adoption is a problem-solving event. Everybody gets what they want out of it. Kid needed a home. Parents wanted to parent. Birth parent wasn't ready to parent. It's a problem-solving event. What is there to grieve? And we live in a society where grief work is not easily acceptable. We don't have any real rituals to grieve the losses associated with adoption and foster care. But we have to do that work in order to get to the other side of that wheel, which is where the healing begins. 
if we do our grief work, we begin to form an identity. We begin to figure out who we are. We begin to examine our belief systems about ourselves, about our connections, and about the world. And if we do our identity work, and we figure out who we are, then we can have intimacy, because we can't have in intimacy if we don't know who we are. That's the trick here. So intimacy becomes a goal, and finally, the end of that journey is the regaining of power and the mastery over our lives that we lost with the losses. That's the image that we're going through with you today. And we're going to explain each of them, but we're literally skipping pebbles across the top of the water here. We're giving you a little appetizer. It's a teaser. That's right. So, loss. We have pages and pages and pages in the book listing losses, listing losses from the adoptee's perspective, from the adoptive parent's perspectives, from the birth birth mother, the birth first father, their extended families. Pages, because we wanted to knock it home for you. We want you to see that the devil is in the details. It's not the big things that bring the losses to the fore. It's a birth mother watching a child being walked across a busy street with somebody holding their hand and wondering, is anybody holding my child's hand? Is my child safe? Does somebody care enough to help them get across the street? It's the adoptive parents taking a child to the doctor who needs surgery. And the doctor saying, do you know if there's any allergies to anesthetics or medications? It's that constant little dripping. It's the devil in the details. Is that making sense to everybody? Yeah. It's the adoptee who gets asked all the time, why aren't you with your real family? Why don't your parents look like you? Why are your parents older than you? Where were you before? Remember my older daughter skipping down the street with her new brother and sister. She was six. They were three and a half and four and a half. And everybody, she was so proud to introduce them. Everybody kept saying, they're not yours. They're not your real brother and sister. Where were they? Where were you hiding them? They don't look like you. By the time she got home, she was in tears. Losses that reverberate out through the family. So what kind of losses are we talking about here? We're talking, first of all, about vicarious losses. Those are the losses that families who adopt children with a lot of trauma unpack into the house when they arrive. So you have this really healthy family system, and in comes a child with aces. And they come in and unpack their little aces in your living room. <laughs> and emotions are catchy. Emotions are catchy. So before you know it, a healthy family is not healthy anymore. The other kids aren't healthy. The parents aren't healthy. Grandparents are tearing their hair out. That's vicarious trauma. That's a birth mother who gets to parent, or a birth father who gets to parent the first time after they've lost a child, who only can unpack that vicarious trauma of losing a child into the next generation or the next set of children. Making sense? Vicarious trauma comes in a suitcase and is catchy. Ambiguous losses are the losses that sometimes really don't make sense to children, particularly. Okay. You know what? I, I have another family out there. <laughs> now, I miss them. I'd like to know who they are. I'd like to know what they look like. I'd like to know what happened to my mother that was out on the streets. I'd like to know what happened to my other siblings I'm not with. But you know what? I kind of like it here. There's food on the table. There's clean sheets. They love me. They don't hurt me. They take good care of me. An ambiguous loss. Make sense? Adoptive parents, if they're really honest with themselves, really wish they could have given birth to this child that they're parenting, that they could have stepped in early in the life, maybe 
had given birth to them, maybe had saved them from some trauma, from some aces. It's not that they don't love the child they have, but they often wonder what it would have been like to have given birth to another child, the child they dreamed of when they were growing up. You can love a child and still miss the child you didn't have. And I always say to social workers, you never gave me the child you described when you matched a child to our family. That's not the child that ever arrived. You lied to me. I had an image of what that child was going to be like, and they showed up a whole other kid. Okay? Secondary, uh, ambiguous losses. And secondary losses come up all the time. They're associated with Mother's Day and Father's Day and friends who leave you and boyfriends who break up with you. Because loss becomes a theme. It becomes a theme. So what do we do about it? Well, one of the first things I tell everybody that I work with is I want a loss in, excuse me, I want a loss inventory. I want you to start before you were ever born. <laughs> what do you think your mother's pregnancy was like? What do you think your birth was like? Think back on it. I want a loss inventory because the devil's in the details and that's how we get to the healing. And for those of you who adopted children right at birth, maybe you were even there in the delivery room, those kids lived someplace else for nine months. And the last three months of that pregnancy, they were aware of voices, of sounds, of arguing, of tenderness, of touching, of caring, of loving. That's gone. Different music, different language perhaps. It's gone. They have a loss at birth. You can't do adoption without loss. Okay. Making sense? Okay. So this is just something for you to look at. Just some examples. We didn't put it even in for, for the adults. But as we said, in the book, there's a lot of information. So what happens to all this loss? Well, as I said earlier, we turn it into rejection. Fear of rejection, feeling of rejection. And we kind of get into an either or experience. Either we, we just kind of sink into the background. What do you want me to be? How do you want me to, you want me to play the piano? I hate playing the piano, I have no talent playing the piano, but if that's what you want me to be, I will bang away at those keys for as long as you need me to because doggone it, I'm not gonna lose you and I'm not gonna be rejected by you. So some people kind of melt in to whatever you want me to be. They morph into what they think other people want them to be. Super good, super bad. Others fight back. And I don't know how many of you have had children who come to you that battle you for control on every single thing. You say up, they say down. You say it's white, they say it's black. And what they're doing is trying to deal with, it's, it's, the message is, I'm going to reject you before you reject me. I'm going to reject you before you reject me. I'm going to prove I'm not worth being kept. See a lot of heads going up and down. Okay. I was going to read you a story, but I think we have to move on. Yep. Actually, what I wanted to say, thank you, Allison, is that rejection, what we learned and we were doing the research for the book, I found this fascinating. You know, rejection triggers the same part of the brain where actual physical pain lives. It actually creates physical pain in the body. You can take a Tylenol and feel better after you've been rejected. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Everyone's however, running for Tylenol. Yeah. Where's the Tylenol, yeah. right? <laughs> however, however, it affects our immune system, our sleep patterns, our appetites, our ability to concentrate. Rejection robs us, and fear of rejection robs us of so much of our day-to-day -day living. It may make it hard for kids to retain information in school. And you know, one of our adoptees in the state, Anne Heffron, talks about adoptionitis in her book. She said she went through all of her life with stomach aches and headaches and back aches from the time she was a little kid. 
and she didn't realize till she was an adult, and she was adopted at birth, and she had a pretty good adoption, but she said she never felt healthy, and she learned to call that her symptoms of adoptionitis. So they may not talk about it, but they frequently are individuals who are frequently not feeling well. So I'm going to do the next three. Can you guys hear me OK? Ooh, that makes a big difference. The next three issues, but I know we're bumping up against the clock. So I'm going to try to do them even a little quicker than I normally would, so my apologies. But the next issue is shame and guilt. And Sharon actually did a really good job talking about the difference between shame and guilt, but I just want to give you a little reminder. So guilt is really adaptive and we use guilt. Any parents in here? Like we use guilt every day, all day. Like we need to learn right from wrong, so we use guilt. Shame is a very different experience. Shame hits the core of our being. Shame is, guilt is I did something wrong. I did something, a behavior. Shame is there's something wrong with me. Something bad, wrong, broken, damaged with me, my being. That's a really big difference. And that can come from ACEs. Can you guys make that connection to what we were talking about earlier? From ACEs, like nobody showed up for the first three years. I'm attached to no one. I had one of my first kids that I worked with. He had killed a cat in his former foster home. And I guess the foster mom loved her cat. So she was like, he was moving out. Not, nothing against cats, but <laughs> um, he had actually spent the first two years of his life in a hotel with his birth mom, who was an addict. Um, when he was detained, he went in and lived with his aunt, and then his grandma, and then another aunt, and then three different foster homes. When I met him at five and a half, zero conscience development, which, by the way, has to be learned through attachment. I have to experience empathy, which is the foundation of a conscience or I don't learn that. A conscience doesn't fall from the sky. It, it's learned through really good, loving parenting. We have to experience empathy in. So this little guy showed up and he truly believed, I know why I killed the cat. And if you were five and a half with no conscience, what would you say? I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. Of course I'm bad, I kill a cat. By the way, I don't feel what the cat feels because nobody feels what I'm feeling. Right? No one has had empathy for my pain, so I have real lack of conscience development. When kids know and they internalize, there's something wrong, damaged, broken, we're shame-based. Significant ACEs score can help us be pretty shame-based. Um, I want to um, read you the self-esteem beliefs that Sharon and I um, put in our book around shame. What does it sound like? Because it isn't just... You know, shame just doesn't sit out here. It actually weaves itself into our narrative, into our what we call our mind state. We all have a mind state, right? A narrative, a belief system about ourself. I want to give you the belief system of our shame-based interior. Sounds like this. I don't matter. No one cares. I'm not important or valuable or worthy. I don't know who I am. I don't know what is right. I am a victim. I don't know how to get close. I am bad. I am worthless. I am nothing to no one. I deserve bad things to happen. That doesn't just change overnight when that is an internal belief system that a child or even an adult may have. Could you see how some of our kids in care, after multiple disruptions, come to that conclusion? Because they often do come to that conclusion. There must be something wrong or bad about me. A shame-based core, by the way, relational trauma can only be healed through relationship. So the healing entity, again, becomes the family system. In fact, research bears this out. One of the longitudinal studies on uh, older placed adopted kids showed that the healing element was the family system. First of all, because we stop moving the child from home to home to home, disrupting attachment, but also because we're planting the child in all the emotional intimacy of the family system. So it is the family system that is that healing element for a child. So 
after all of this shame, and I'll go back to the traumatic losses Sharon was talking about, the feelings or fear of rejection leading to feelings of shame or guilt, and now we're led to grief. And I actually, if you could, if you had a handout, I'd actually have you circle it, circle it about 50 times, because this is where the work of the core issues lay. We can't avoid the grief and the loss. One of the things Sharon was alluding to, can you guys see this great little piece down here on the bottom? Yeah, those of you that can read it, it says feelings, and then there's an on or off switch. Yeah, grief work is messy, because you actually have to feel it. And when I say feel it, you have to think about your sensory system. You have, actually have to be in your body. Go back to aces for a second. Remember our aces that were four or more? If I don't want to feel what I'm feeling in my body most of the time, I'm more apt to start using something because I don't want to feel. When we have either a family system or a broader culture that doesn't grieve well or allow for the space and the time for grief and grieving, our kids and our families can be in trouble. We cannot heal what we cannot acknowledge. Sharon said earlier that often adoption is seen as a solution, where we go, well, you were adopted at birth, so what's the problem? And by the way, for many of our children, their core issues surface in adolescence. And why adolescence? Because when you're babies, this is what you understand about adoption. And then when you're about five, it expands, and we understand a little bit more. But really, it's often when we're an adolescent and we can think really deeply and abstractly and we're feeling really deeply and intensely and now I really know what I lost. And for the child that was adopted, what they lost was not just a birth mother here and a birth father here. This birth mother had a whole familial tree she was connected to with a history and a lineage and a culture and a narrative and all the relationships on this whole familial tree, and that's just one tree, then this paternal familial tree, right, with a history, a lineage, a call, I lost a lot. And now I understand what I lost. And where can I take all of these feelings and the confusion that I feel about this? Because remember, in adolescence, the main psychosocial challenge is what we call identity formation versus identity confusion. What if I lost a lot of things that I need to figure out who I am? We add additional tasks for the adoptee. And then put on top of that our culture's narrative around it was a, a fix, like we solved the problem. You were adopted a long time ago. Why is this coming up now? By the way, across our residential treatment centers nationally, these are residential treatment facilities, about 40% of the patients in those residential treatment centers are adoptees, which is not surprising, right? But up 2% of the population. Yeah. So we cannot heal again what we cannot acknowledge. So it's why we actually felt really passionate about writing the book also, so we can work harder to acknowledge the additional complexities that adoption creates without pathologizing the process. Does that make sense? So the, the work of grief takes time, space, and it's one of the reasons why we highly recommend, um, if your family system was touched by adoption or foster care, you find what we call an adoption clinically competent therapist. Most therapists would have no idea, and by the way, how often we work with families that say, I've been in therapy for 10 years and we haven't touched on anything connected to adoption, trauma, or attachment. And by the way, it's like the three-legged stool. You want to find someone that really gets the interconnection of all three of those things. So I want to segue to identity. Sharon did a, a great way to kind of talk about this is one of the healing core issues. So really, the way I want to explain identity is really just through a poem that I want to read um, to you. Um, because identity in particular, if I don't know who I am, let's say I've missed a lot of my puzzle pieces. They've been lost to me. By the way, the more we move children from home to home, Adults carry memories. Children don't carry memories the way adults do. So if a child moved when they were three and moved again when they were five and they lost those caregivers, they lost pieces of themselves, parts of their story and their narrative that are now lost to them. It's hard to create a whole cohesive narrative around who I am, a cohesive self, 
if I'm missing a lot of pieces to my history or story. It's why you see a lot, a lot of adoptees go into search and reunion. Um, what we really call it is the lifelong search for self. I'm actually looking for my missing pieces or parts of my narrative or story to create a cohesive whole around this thing called identity formation. I'm going to read you a, a story um, or a poem from an adoptee. It's one of my favorite poems. She's a teenager, a Native American adopted into a white family. Um, and for me, it's beautifully said around her challenge around identity. And it's called, Whose Face Do I Carry? And I love to pull the voices of our adoptees into the room when we're really talking about them. Um, a beautiful poem by Tara Dawn. Whose face do I carry? I often sit and wonder that very question. Whose face do I carry? Do I have my mother's smile or even my dad's laughter? Years have passed and my adult years have taken over, but the memories of my childhood still sit on my mind. Whose face do I carry? Long nights, mother, can you hear my cries? Can you possibly be wondering on who I am? Where have you gone now? Do you wait up nights wondering if the phone will ring with news of my arrival? as I wait for yours? Have you asked the very same questions that haunt me? Why, mother, have you gone? Was it better for me or better for you? Whose face do I carry? When we think about identity, I'd have us think about that we're all on this quest. Sorry, I do want you to get up. <laughs> Uh -huh. We're all on a quest for identity formation, but there are often more obstacles for our kids. Um, and not just our kids, but well into the adult years when they're missing significant pieces of their story and their narrative. And one of the things that, that Sharon and I always talk about is um, how excited we are about the adoptee movement. Those of you, if there are any adoptees in the room, um, all you have to do is go on social media where you actually see our adoptees really kind of reclaiming their narrative in a, in a different way, really wanting to open up their birth certificates. Right now, our, uh, California has sealed birth certificates. There's so many things that um, are not accessible for adoptees in particular, and adoptees are kind of uh, collectively actually finding their voice and demanding equal rights because um, many of you may not know it, but um, they don't have the same rights to even some of their information. Um, so it's a really exciting time for our adoptees. I'm gonna, um, we wanna honor uh, Newport Beach's library commitment to time. So what I'd like to do is just comment that, that I, as I said earlier, identity allows us to move into intimacy. And without it, we kind of go from relationship to relationship because we're really afraid to commit. So what I want to do is move forward from here. And, we have um, to show them this cute one. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorite Thank cartoons. you for laughing. <laughs> yes, one of my, one of my favorite commitments. Um, I want to move just quickly into mastery and control and turn it back over to the audience because there's just so much we could talk about with you. But I mentioned at the beginning that everybody lost power and control. And, and the beauty of adoption is we learn a lot of new skills. Adoption for me is about adaptation. It's about our adapting to who the children are that we really receive. It's about learning new skills. It's about opening our heart. It's about confronting our fears. It's about meeting people who are maybe very different from us and embracing them as important to our children. It's about supporting our children's journey if they feel a need to go out and do some searching and integrating other people back into their lives. It's really a journey that benefits all of us. It's a benefit for growth. It's a benefit for spirituality. It's a benefit in everything that we do. I'm passionate about the things we get, the gains we get out of this journey. And um, what I would say is, I want to go to the summary. Um, what I would say is that we want you to come away with just three really important pieces, and then we're going to ask you a question. Um, it's real important to look at the significant number of people today that are formed 
through added ways of growing families and how really important it is to acknowledge that, that everybody touched by that has more work to do. They need our support. They don't need somebody saying, why are you raising that question or why are you stirring the pot? A lot of you mentioned to me earlier that you know a lot of adoptees who are not interested. They're very happy with who they are and thank God for that. Girls, women are more apt to want to get more information as they move towards childbearing age because they want to know more about what they're carrying genetically before they give birth. But more and more men are searching as well. And rather than our seeing that as some kind of a failure, we ought to see that as a mastery issue. Some of us are very, very curious. Other people live life day to day, and that is their mastery. The past isn't significant. The future they don't worry about. Today, things are good. I got a good family. I got a job. I'm loved. I don't want to go stirring up the pot. There are people who live really well that way. There's nothing wrong with that. But for those who have a need to know, we ought to be doing everything we can to change the laws in California and to support people who want to know everything that they want and need to know about themselves. And if we talk about the birth first families, they deserve to know. They deserve to know after an earthquake, after a fire, whatever it might be, after a plane crash, that their children are alive, that somebody loves them, that they're being cared for. They're often our forgotten group out there who sit quietly wanting to know, wanting to know, wanting to know wondering. Adoption is like a puzzle. And if you go to a garage sale and you pick up a puzzle and half the top is torn off, you don't even know what it's supposed to look like. And you don't know if all the puzzle pieces are in the box, but you're brave. And you take it home and you dump it out on the kitchen table and your job is to put that puzzle together. You're not even sure what it's supposed to look like, but by God, you're going to do it. And some of the puzzle pieces don't fit together, so you cut them and you scram them in there. <laughs> oh, see, puzzle makers. But you make it work, and you may come out with kind of a wonky picture, but you can live with it. Okay? That's kind of like adoption. Some of us can make wonky pictures and live with it. Other people are always looking for the missing pieces, and that's part of their mastery. Let's not make it wrong that members of the constellation have different needs and that those needs come up at different times developmentally over time and that the best thing we can do as family members is to support them to get their needs met and not take it personally because they're asking about other people and have needs that we might not be able to provide for them. We can provide the support. Adoption losses are often left unnamed, ungrieved, unacknowledged. And we have to do a better job of that in our society. We're all in that boat together. I want you to go back to that initial statement. One person rocks the boat, everybody can fall out. And how we've lived with this is with fear of each other. It's time to embrace each other so that the child involved gets the benefit of what everybody wanted in the first place. Make sense? OK. So what we want you to do is to take one minute to think about one word that describes the feelings that have come up for you during this presentation. Just You don't have to share it. Think of one word that comes up for you based on what we've shared in the last hour. Difficult. Yeah, yeah. We're not asking you to share. We're, we're pleased that you are. Yeah. Proud. Huh? Proud. Proud. <coughs> what? Inclusion. Inclusion. Inspired. Inspired. Yeah. Compassion. Compassion. Mm. What? Empathy. Empathy. Progress. Ah, oh, love that. <laughs> yeah. 
So now we'd like to ask you what questions, because we have taken some really, don't forget, we teach this in a 48-hour class. <laughs> you got an hour. Okay. What have we left you with? Are you going, that's enough, right? An hour's good. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to turn this off? Yeah. Go ahead, Al. Yeah, any questions? One sec, she's going to bring a microphone. Right here. On your lost diagram. On your lost diagram, it's talking about how you know you go through the stages and the shame and guilt and then the grief and then identity and then intimacy. You can only arrive at intimacy after you form identity. I'm talking about like with your child. So currently I have a, a, a foster child and I feel there's no intimacy or no connection. And maybe that's more about attachment than intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, but does she have to go through that grieving? Yeah, so it's a great question. How long have you had her? Um, since the beginning of February, yeah. And how old is she? 10. And how many other placements has she had? Just one before. One before? Yeah. But lots of traumas. Lots of traumas. Lots of traumas. Right. So think about all that her sensory system has absorbed, that she mostly has been in isolation with that pain, that amount of pain. So if you're the primary attachment caregiver, there are two basic tasks in attachment. When we are, as the parent, creating what we call a secure attachment relationship with a child, so the two tasks, and by the way, it's always really important for parents to know, if I'm going to create a secure base to the, with a child, I actually have to move towards their distress and pull their distress into me. So we're down-regulating, that's the first task, which actually means we have to be, as the parent, mostly pretty regulated, which is hard. <laughs> I see you're like, yeah, and all parents are going, really? I'm supposed to stay regulated most of the time? Because we get easily dysregulated. So much of about emotional intimacy in particular if they can't gauge and predict our internal state as being mostly calm and emotionally available to them, they're in hyperarousal and distress all the time. So if the parent's going to be able to lead that dance of attachment, we have to engage in those two tasks every day, 50 times, over and over again. The other task, by the way, is up-stimulating her into a pleasure state through human contact. So when we do those two tasks, and by the way, the good news, those of you parents that are like, I'm not sure I'm doing that, 50 times every day <laughs> over and over again. You only have to hit that need, and I mean her emotional need. And by the way, it's never what's coming out of her mouth. That's always a really important piece. If she's 10 and she's defensive and guarded and grieving her traumatic losses, she might say, get away from me and I hate you and you're not my mother and do all of that pushing. Do not listen to the words because that's not telling you what her need is. She, we cannot heal if we can't get connected to another human in a loving, safe, calm way. So we don't get stuck on her words. We actually have to move towards her distress and pull it into us over time. We only have to hit that need, by the way, 50% of the time. How cool is that? Which actually means we can mess it up 50% of the time. Whoop! So we don't have to be perfect. That's always a good thing. But if you are going to become the external psychobiological regulator of her internal affective state and think ACEs, she's in a lot of distress. So we actually want to do what we call therapeutic joining. It's much more about attachment in this moment. And the, the key is that the parent in particular has to stay pretty emotionally regulated themselves. So how, and by the way, I do, I do a support group for parents. Some of our parents are in here. So if you need some additional support, come talk to me after class and we can help you get what you need. By the way, much of this is not intuitive. And by the way, attachment precedes discipline. So it's very difficult to start disciplining a 10-year-old you are not attached to, and they are not attached to you. You actually have to attach and discipline at the same time. Very complex. It's actually what leads to a lot of disruptions for our kids. So there's a certain way to parent and style to parent that does both at the same time. But again, not intuitive. So it takes a lot of support and, and, and learning. So talk to me afterwards if you and need I help. Would add one more thing. As long as the adoption isn't finalized, that child is still treading water. Yeah. And so you're not going to make a yeah. lot of progress because from that child's perspective, this isn't permanent. 
Yes. And so it isn't until you know you're going to stay, and then you have a period of time where you've stayed, that you're really going to begin to build some Velcro on your heart that allows you to attach and detach. I found a book, and I don't know if anybody's heard of it, called Maybe, My Maybe, Maybe Mom and Dad. Yes, um, Maybe Mom and Dad. Yes, Living in Between. Yeah. Not knowing. Yeah. And, yeah. And I, I like the image of thinking about kids treading water. They're not going anywhere. They're trying to survive and not drown. You don't have a lot of time and attention to give to the rest of what it is you want. Hmm. Yes. I have a 15-year-old granddaughter that I would guess probably has five or six aces. And um, thank you so much for the information. I find one thing that is so uh, troublesome and in the search for their identity and everything you said makes sense, there is such a strong feeling to protect her from finding out who and all about her first family. And they did have her for 17 months, but we got to know a lot of the family because she wasn't released for adoption until she was four. So we have a drug abuse situation. The mom's given up two other children, and the grandmother was schizophrenic. We don't want her to carry that kind of a burden. And I can see that she is the one searching for those puzzle pieces. If you know that much about her first family, do you understand the conundrum when you want to protect them? We just said your mom was sick and she couldn't take care of you. We haven't gone into any detail with her because it just seems so cruel. But she is one of the seekers. Hi, my name is Mary Jane. I'm an adoptee from Taiwan. And um, so I, I also work in adoption and foster care. So um, I hear what you're saying, how difficult it is to, and how much you want to protect your adopted daughter from all of that. But for her, if you look at it from her perspective, there's something in us as adoptees that deeply desire to connect with, with our first families. And I can't explain it. Um, I reunited with my birth family in Taiwan in 2012, and they didn't have a you know real positive history, but I made the journey, and I'm glad that I did. Um, so I would say that at least maybe be open to that idea and let her decide, you know, how she sees her first family. Um, I don't know if that helps at all, but I think that there's such a pull. I mean, it doesn't mean that she spends time with her mom if she's still using and it's not safe. But I think it's also really important that you try to speak of her family in a really positive way, even though you know <laughs> what's going on, that she, she understands that um, maybe her mom really did love her, you know, wanted to care for her and just wasn't able to, that that's, that's really important to preserve that for her. I don't want to comment on what she said. Uh, we happen to have five adopted grandchildren. One word I didn't see up here was guilt. And I think what so often happens when parents adopt children, they do the best they can and then they have issues and problems and then they feel that they have failed and, and then they are embarrassed and then they don't want to talk about it. And we had that issue, especially with a, a grandson who was adopted at six months from Korea. Uh, at the age of 14, he became violent with 
separation, anxiety, anger. He started breaking up the house, putting out windows, pictures of, it was, it was a horrible situation. And my son and daughter-in-law sent him away to a place called Promise Village, a Christian place. He was there for 18 months and rehabilitated. He's now graduating this year from the University of Cincinnati. He's totally turned around. But in that process, my son received so many letters from so many families who had adopted children, who had gone through similar situations, and who were suffering from tremendous guilt. Yes. I do want to make one comment on, on the, the moms. And by the way, it's a really common challenge around what you were just describing, the balancing act between protecting our children from really difficult truths, truths or history. What we can inadvertently do is, as parents, especially if we wait way too long to give them the full truth of their story, they can't grieve the loss that they have. And it's hard to form your identity when you don't know why it happened. They need to know why. Otherwise, it continues to be a mystery, and they're not sure why they're with you. It actually really helps them to understand. As painful as it might be, truth-telling is really one of our core beliefs around what children most need to really form who they are. It may be a difficult truth, but they deserve and need the truth because it's really why they're with you. Because if they were in a perfect family to begin with, they wouldn't be with you. And as long as they're in the supportive family, and, and our kind of rule of thumb is, is like this, that a child should have all their truth, all the parts of their story, no matter how difficult, before they launch from the safe harbor of the family. So before that, because then it's harder for them to grieve. Remember, you're doing the grief work with them. They get their truth from you. They will be grieving with you. You'll be grieving with them. I actually had a family that called me. It was a family I worked with years ago. And they called me because the birth mother died tragically. And they found out about this, and their daughter was eight years old. And they got her at birth, and they said, we don't want to tell her because it's going to break her heart. And it broke their heart because they knew she'll never meet her now. And they were in openness originally. Um, and they went, do we protect her and never tell her or don't tell her? So one of the things we did is navigate, navigate through their grief and then set up um, the family's ability to grieve together. They were all grieving. Remember how we put the constellation members all in the middle? When we grieve together, and we have families create a grief ritual or rule. Families that do their pain together do pretty well together. So it's not that they're out here grieving alone. We are all having these core issues connected to grief and loss. So even the telling of their truth creates grief and loss for us, and it creates grief and loss for them. But it's the opportunity for healing and a deepening of their understanding and identity formation. So sometimes when we protect them from their story, they can't grieve in developmentally appropriate ways. Does that make sense? And I get it, because in our more kind of helicopterish parenting world, we do want to protect. We get that. We're balancing the, the truth-telling with their need to grieve and understand their truth and their story, which is really important as an adoptee. So I appreciate um, those adoptees that are willing to share. We are being told that we were, we were stopped three minutes ago. 
<laughs> so we want to thank again the Newport Beach Library and the Foundation for inviting us. And we are here for a few minutes. Uh, we'll sign books, we'll talk to you, and, uh, and we want to thank you very much. For yes, thank you guys. Nice.